Nazi on that. Should we down the line? Down line? And then question yeah, amongst you yourselves. Can, you can have some back and forth before the game. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a mic like to do that. There's only one microphone now. Okay. It's in the back. Or actually, it's two back here. Because we have lunch, we got to get some I specialize in the minor virtues, like right. punctuality. The big ones for. Mercy, tyranny. Well, so I'm not too good at that, but I got the minor virtues set a tone. Was oh, that right? There you go. To compliance with the major virtues. Okay. That's my theory. Good morning. Let's uh, come to order. I'm uh, Tom Griffith of the D.C. Circuit, and I've been asked to uh, moderate this uh, uh, panel. Should federal law enjoy a uh, presumption of constitutionality? Uh, and, and tipping my hand where I stand on, on the debate, I'm going to play a very minimal role. Uh, um, uh, and I will introduce our, our panelists. Uh, they will then speak uh, in the order after they've been introduced. We'll then have uh, some time. They've been, they've been allotted eight minutes each, which I will uh, scrupulously hold them to. And then uh, there will be discussion uh, among the panelists, and we'll leave uh, 10, 15 minutes at the end for uh, questions from, uh, from the audience. But... It's my pleasure to, to introduce our, our panelists. Uh, uh, Clark Neely joined the Institute for Justice as a senior attorney in 2000. Uh, he litigates economic liberty, property rights, school choice, First Amendment, and other constitutional cases in both federal and state courts. In his private capacity, Clark represented the plaintiffs in District of Columbia versus Heller, which confirmed that the Second Amendment protects the right to own a gun for self-defense, a right that was first recognized by the D.C. Circuit and a panel in which I sat. Uh, Clark is also the director of IJ's Center for Judicial Engagement and the author of the book Terms of Engagement, How Our Courts Should Enforce the Constitution's Promise of Limited Government. Clark received his undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Texas and clerked for Judge Royce Lamberth on the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. Ed Whalen is president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where he directs the uh, Center's program on the Constitution, the courts, and culture. His areas of expertise include constitutional law and the judicial confirmation process. Ed also is a regular contributor to National Review's online bench memos blog. Ed was the principal deputy assistant attorney general in the Office of Legal Counsel during the Bush 43 administration and has also served as general counsel to the U.S. Sentencing, U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary. In 2011, the National Law Journal named Ed among its champions and visionaries in the practice of law in D.C. The National Law Journal praised him for, quote, pioneering the field of legal blogging and for offering commentary that infuses national debates over judicial nominees, Supreme Court ethics, and appellate court decisions. Ed attended Harvard for both his undergraduate and law degrees, clerked for Judge J. Clifford Wallace of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, as well as Justice Antonin Scalia. And finally, uh, David McIntosh should need no introduction to any Federal Society gathering, but to give him fair uh, shake with the others, I'll, I'll mention. Uh, David McIntosh is uh, now the president of Club for Growth, a former congressman representing Indiana's 2nd Congressional District, uh, and as a freshman, he chaired the Subcommittee on Regulatory Relief. Uh, congressman McIntosh also passed the Congressional Review Act and championed the elimination of the marriage penalty in the Federal Tax Code. During the Reagan administration, he served as special assistant to Attorney General Ed Meese, and during the Bush administration, he was executive director of the President's Council on Competitiveness and assistant to the Vice President. He, of course, is co-founder of the Federalist Society and serves on its board of directors. Prior to joining the Club for Growth, David was a partner at Mayor Brown in Washington, D.C. He received his under undergraduate degree from Yale and his law degree from the University of Chicago Law School. With that, we'll, turn the, we'll start it off with Clark. Well, thank you very much, Judge. Uh, <clears throat> eight minutes doesn't seem like a very long time to upend one of the most hallowed doctrines in all of constitutional law. Um, fortunately, it's so pernicious that it might just be enough time. Um, I'd start by asking all of you a question, um, and, and this doesn't have to be precise. It just can come from the gut. Um, ask yourself this question. On any originalist reading of the Constitution, I don't care what school of originalism, original understanding, original meaning, original intent, it doesn't matter. On any originalist understanding of the Constitution, approximately what percentage of the federal government today is unconstitutional? Let me give you a moment to reflect on it. It's a serious question. Let me give you a moment to reflect on that. I'll ask you one more question. <clears throat> 
Is anybody in the room in the single digits? Anybody? All right, good. <clears throat> so by a group consensus, it appears that most of the people in this room believe that a substantial portion of the federal government is in fact unconstitutional. I would argue that that is Congress's fault and the judiciary's responsibility. Uh, if you think about the production of laws like the production of anything else on a factory line, for example, the people who produce products have a responsibility to make sure that they are not defective, and the people who inspect those products before they come off or as they come down the production line also have a responsibility to ensure that they are not defective. Our judiciary has largely abdicated its responsibility to pull defective laws off the line. That's my thesis. Um, and I believe that the vehicle for that has been the presumption of constitutionality, and specifically the, the presumption of the constitutionality of federal laws. Because the presumption of constitutionality that the Supreme Court applies today really isn't a presumption at all. It is an assumption of constitutionality. It is a virtually irrebuttable presumption of constitutionality, and that's where um, the problem arises, in my view. Um, let's take a moment and just re, re, uh, sort of review, for those who aren't litigators, what the normal role of a presumption is in litigation. The normal role of a presumption in litigation is to shift the burden of production to the party in charge of the, or in possession of the relevant information. Again, the normal role of a presumption in litigation is to shift the burden of production to the party in possession of the relevant information. And the thing that's so astonishing about the presumption of constitutionality is it does precisely the opposite. After all, it is the government that is in possession of the relevant information. Those are basically two points. What is the purpose for which this law was enacted? It is, a, is it a valid constitutional end that you are pursuing? And second, do the facts support whatever your assertion is? And I'll get into that in a moment. So the government is in possession of the two pieces of relevant, relevant information. What are the facts that are concerning here? And what is your constitutional end? And yet, we switch the burden of production to the party who is not in possession of either of, uh, of those pieces of information, namely a plaintiff challenging the constitutionality of government law. So right off the bat, I think we should be or have reason to be suspicious of the presumption of constitutionality and wonder if it is really something else, which in fact it is. It is not an evidentiary presumption. Um, it is basically a policy judgment that the, that the acts of Congress should be upheld pretty much regardless of whether they are in fact constitutional uh, or unconstitutional. Um, does anybody in the room know uh, there's a federal law that makes it illegal to write a futures contract for a particular product? Just one. Anybody know what it is? Yes, sir. Onions. onions. That's right. In the, middle 19, in the middle of the 1950s, some onion farmers in Michigan got swindled in an onion futures deal. They went to their congressman, who happened to be Jerry Ford, who got a law passed making it illegal to write a futures contract for the humble onion. That law was challenged in court and upheld, and the judge did something very interesting and not at all unusual that to me gives up the whole game when it comes to the presumption of constitutionality. The judge did not even permit the challengers to introduce evidence of the irrationality of that law. The judge instead simply said, Congress has identified a purpose, and that is conclusive. What was the purpose of making it illegal to write onion futures contract? Was it to stop the international communist conspiracy? To prevent the spread of nuclear weapons? Or reduce volatility in the onion market? Well, those all three actually have one thing in common. They are all completely without basis in fact. It happens that the Congress cited the last one as a basis for the law, and the court accepted it at face value, even though it was demonstrably false. And perhaps why, that's why the plaintiffs weren't permitted to introduce evidence, because they would have been able to demonstrate that the factual premise of the law was false. And this has, in fact, been vindicated by subsequent economists who've looked at the, uh, the onion uh, uh, market and uh, have determined that um, the law has, in fact, had the opposite of its stated um, uh, purpose. So, um, one takeaway for me is whatever we want to say about the presumption of constitutionality, we must not let it become a device that essentially eliminates from the Constitution textual limits on government power. And we have done that again and again and again. 
We did it, for example, to the contracts clause in a case called Blaisdell, uh, where the state of Minnesota basically permitted farmers and other uh, lender, uh, borrowers to rewrite the, the, the terms of their loans um, in the middle of the, uh, the Great Depression. Uh, the contracts clause was interestingly put in the Constitution for precisely that purpose, to prevent people from renegotiating the terms of their loans during an economic downturn, and the Supreme Court permitted it to happen anyway. That is, rewriting the Constitution. The Supreme Court did it again in the Kelo case, which my organization, the Institute for Justice, litigated. The Supreme Court effectively deleted the public use provision from the Fifth Amendment, and it did so by applying an essentially irrebuttable presumption of constitutionality. And we have done the same ever since the Wicker decision in 19, whatever it was, 43, 40, 42. Um, we have been applying an essentially irrebuttable presumption to the co uh, constitutionality of federal laws, and we've done the same thing to the doctrine of federalism that the Supreme Court did to the public use provision uh, and the contracts clause. I personally think this has been a disaster for liberty. It's been a disaster for limited government. Overregulation, as I suspect every single person in this room understands, is destroying the engine of American prosperity. I will say that again. Overregulation is destroying the engine of American prosperity. How much of that overregulation is unconstitutional? We have no idea because we have a judiciary that is not seriously asking that question. Instead, what we have is a judiciary that asks itself, can I think of any way in which this law might be constitutional. And for the past 70 years, with very small handful of exceptions, the answer has been yes. These judges are mostly former appellate lawyers. Our chief justice is probably the foremost appellate lawyer of his generation, maybe several generations. And if the question is, can John Roberts think of a way in which A might be B, black might be white, the answer is always going to be yes. He's a really brilliant guy. So if he starts out asking the wrong question, can I think of some way to shoehorn this law into the framework of the Constitution? The answer is always going to be yes. It's the wrong question to be asking, and we've been reaping the whirlwind. Um, there is a secondary definition to the word presumption. I just looked it up. Behavior deemed as arrogant, disrespectful, and transgressing the limits of what is permitted or appropriate. Shame on us for our presumption in repudiating the framers' plan of limited government that was expressed with unmistakable clarity in the text of the Constitution. Shame on us for our presumption. Uh, thanks very much to all of you. I'm pleased to be here with my uh, regular sparring partner, Clark, here. I wish very much that we lived in the alternative universe Clark described in which, lo and behold, courts, the, the, the most grievous abuse one can find is that courts are uh, deferring to federal laws barring onion futures contracts. Uh, alas, uh, that's not the world we live in. You can look uh, you know, as recently as two years ago, say, to the uh, ruling in the uh, US v. Windsor to see that we have judges striking down on a whim laws that they ought to be uh, deferring to. And I think in many ways it's this, the, the question that we're facing here, should federal law enjoy a presumption of constitutionality, is the wrong way to get into a whole host of interesting issues. That said, it's a question I've been posed, so I will try to address it. First, there's no question that the word presumption can sound so presumptuous and can uh, trigger an instinct against it. But all that this means, of course, is that the person claiming that the federal law is unconstitutional bears the burden of showing that. Contrary to what Clark says, there's no you know, magic rule that the, the burden uh, is always borne by the party in possession of information, nor is there any monopoly uh, uh, on uh, that information here. The presumption is rebuttable, not conclusive. It's a very, very modest presumption. And I'd rephrase the question as, may judges set aside federal laws in the absence of a showing that they are, in fact, unconstitutional. This really ties into a broader debate over judicial restraint versus judicial activism that perhaps we can get to uh, in the questions. Now, Clark properly referred to this presumption of constitutionality as, I believe, a, a hallowed doctrine. And it, uh, that's correct, and it's correct for good reason. Uh, Judicial restraint and, and this presumption of constitutionality, I think, inhere in a proper understanding of the Constitution as an exercise in self-government, of uh, the limited role that judges have in overriding democratic enactments. Uh, 
Uh, as Alexander Hamilton put it in Federalist 78, if there should happen to be an irreconcilable variance between the Constitution and, and, uh, and, and the law, that which has a superior obligation of validity ought, of course, to be preferred. Irreconcilable variance. Uh, he further said that if courts instead are simply exercising will instead of judgment, the consequence would equally be the substitution of their pleasure to that of the legislative body. John Marshall, way back in Fletcher v. Peck, it is not on slight implication and vague conjecture that the legislature is to be pronounced to have transcended its powers and its act to be considered void. The opposition between the Constitution and the law should be such that a judge feels a clear and strong conviction of their incom incompatibility with each other. So I would uh, say that not only should there be a presumption of constitutionality, but a federal law should not be set aside unless it is clear that the law is unconstitutional. Now one could debate just what that standard of clarity means. I think there, there are extreme versions that I reject, such as the uh, James Bradley Thayer uh, version, uh, but there are far more modest versions uh, that, that I embrace. And the notion is that a judge does not have warrant to override a democratic enactment unless he can say with a requisite degree of confidence that the enactment violates the Constitution. This uh, proposition has nothing to do with a congressional dysfunction, has nothing to do with whatever criticisms one might have of how legislatures operate. Legislatures have never operated uh, uh, in, in a uh, you know, manner that anyone would uh, deem admirable. Uh, the the, the uh, core tenets of, ju of judicial restraint instead lie in the restrictions on, on the role of the judiciary. I would argue further that um, this uh, effort to empower an activist judiciary, this, this uh, new term, judicial engagement, which always makes me think, uh, okay, when's the judicial wedding, um, <laughs> uh, is, 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 a, is a bad move, apart from being, um, I think, wrongly principled, it's really imprudent and disastrous in practice. This is a way uh, of empowering the progressives. You want judicial engagement? Well, I tell you, you'll have plenty of uh, Obama appointees on the court who will be very, very ready to provide it. And you know, uh, you know, the, the, the libertarians probably still aren't going to win their battle against uh, uh, Onions Futures contracts, uh, but they'll lose a lot more in terms of advance of statism. So I think that uh, libertarians and conservatives need to unite, unify around a sound understanding of originalism. The debate ought to be over what particular provisions of the Constitution mean, not over what sort of fists you want to have on the scale uh, as you approach a, a particular issue. And if we have, if we are able to maintain this coalition, uh, if of course we're, we're lucky enough to, to have um, uh, to a good president elected in 2016, there's potential for correcting a lot of the errors that Clark wants to see corrected and, and, and as importantly, making sure that we don't see um, more errors uh, inflicted on us. But we do not live in a legal regime that suffers from an excess of judicial modesty, uh, just the opposite. Uh, and uh, we, we ought to uh, insist on uh, those who argue that federal laws are unconstitutional, meeting their modest burden of actually demonstrating that that's the case. So with that, I'll leave further back and forth with uh, uh, Clark to uh, the uh, Q&A. Thank you, Clark and Ed. Um, so let me uh, begin my remarks by saying I viewed this less as a question about a rule of evidence and more of a uh, constitutional question, as Ed was pointing to, it, part of the inherent definition of what is the proper role of the courts. Um, also looked up uh, Federalist 78, and, and as Ed already shared with you, so I, I don't need to go into that part of my remarks, he's done it well. I will point to you a book that helped me think about it by a member of Congress, Ron DeSantis, called Dreams from Our Founding Fathers. <laughs> Appropriately titled, right? Um, First Principles in the Age of Obama. Um, it's a great book and exposition and effort by a guy who's in politics to take seriously the Constitution. Um, and what I did want to say to you um, was a little bit about how the legislature acts and, and thinking in that. Um, because of the, I think the reason we're asking ourselves this 
do congressional acts really deserve to be presumed to be constitutional is becoming a greater topic as people sense more and more that we have a dysfunctional legislative branch. Um, and a couple observations I realized while serving there. First, when it comes to the Constitution and their notion of what powers they have and don't have, most members of Congress essentially act as if they were a member of the British Parliament. Um, which is to say, what, what has been done in the past, we'll assume that's what we should do now, um, rather than thinking through what are the powers that are granted us in the Constitution, what's our duty under the Constitution to uphold those and implement and, and write the laws. Um, that uh, creates a lot of problems as um, Congress over the years starts doing actions that really aren't found in Article I. Uh, because nobody steps back in the body and questions, is this our constitutional role? The second problem that we see in the modern Congress is, and it's explained well um, by economists of all people, the public choice theory, uh, it's congressmen love to get credit for good things and to avoid responsibility for bad things um, because their primary goal is to get themselves reelected. Um, so, passing a law that may or may not be constitutional but gets you credit with the voters for doing something good and then tossing it over to the courts for them to sort out if there are any constitutional problems um, is a, one of the several ways that they engage in this behavior. Another one is the legislative um, devolvement of power to the regulatory agencies so they can pass a bill that says we're for cleaner air. So who can argue with that? Um, and then when EPA comes back and says, well, here's what you have to do to get cleaner air, you've got to shut down all of the utilities in the Midwest because they're polluting by producing carbon dioxide. Congressman can say, well, we didn't mean that they should do that. That's a terrible idea. Um, so don't blame me. Go, go blame somebody over at EPA. Um, that problem happens all the time is an institutional one, and it also applies to the president from time to time. And I'm thinking back of the example of the McCain-Feingold bill. Clearly unconstitutional, clearly consensus among Republicans in Congress that we're in charge of Congress, that it's unconstitutional. Uh, clearly the president believed it was, but it was very popular. So it passes the House, it passes the Senate, they send it to the President hoping he'll veto it. Um, the President says, well, I don't like it, I think it's probably unconstitutional, but it's the will of the people, I'm going to sign it, tosses it to the courts, and the courts say, look, you guys passed this thinking it's constitutional, we're not going to save your bacon on this. Um, and it ends up being a terrible bill, a terrible precedent that now the courts are through various cases starting to unwind and correct. Um, but it's a great example of how both the legislature and the president were unwilling to do something they thought was unpopular, even though they recognized and part of their constitutional duty would be not to pass that type of law. It's, it's kind of like um, children, really, if uh, those of you who are parents, who want know they should do something wrong but want the candy and sneak around and reach into the candy bowl, grab it when nobody's looking, um, and at some level are sort of hoping the parents will stop them, but if they can get away with it, we'll get away with it. So I can see the reason that, that there's a pressure to change this presumption, have the courts police that type of activity. Um, I think there are two problems with it, and one of them Ed shared in his presentation, I, I think, You've got courts who already are very tempted to legislate. Uh, removing that presumption opens the floodgates to more efforts of, well, we don't have to presume that it was constitutional, but we can fix it for them or, or go ahead and make it void if we don't like it. Uh, and it, it's an example that um, is very fraught with danger, I often tell Folks, be careful what you ask for because of the unintended consequences. But the second problem is one that perhaps is less evident, and it is that 
by doing that, if we had a structure where the courts would feel it's their prerogative to rewrite legislation or not presume that what Congress has done is constitutional and, and decide they can fix it or just exacerbates the problem with the problem children. Um, if they know the courts are going to um, go in and rewrite the legislation, all the more will, will they be willing to pass the, the bill that says we're doing good things and hope that the court someday will fix it so that it doesn't really do bad things. Um, and so I think, it, like the McCain-Feingold example, they were surprised that when the court said, we're not going to do that for you. Um, so I've thought about it, and what's a better approach to solving the problem of a dysfunctional Congress? And as you step back and think about it, it's essentially the one that the Founding Fathers anticipated and assumed, which is the people will throw out a bad Congress and replace it with a good Congress. So the, the short answer is elect more people like Ron DeSantis, uh, people who um, think about the Constitution, think about their role and duties in a legislative branch in constitutional terms. And if you want to extend the parental analogy, from time to time you have to spank the problem child in order to get their attention and, and get them to do what is right. So rather than make it easier for them to continue in the, the misbehavior, which they have every incentive to do to try to get reelected, create, have the voters create the incentive, if you're not going to follow the Constitution and pass constitutional laws, we're going to vote you out of office. Um, and it doesn't need to happen that many times before the rest of them think, oh, well, we better make sure what we're doing is constitutional because I don't want to be the next guy uh, on the voters' hit list and, and lose my office. Few insights from having been there and observed the, the political dynamic in which all of this will play itself out up in Congress. Thank you for letting me speak. Okay, now we'd like to have a discussion uh, amongst the panelists. Clark, you want to get started and respond? Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to where I started, which is uh, how much of the existing federal government do people think is unconstitutional? And I take it by people's response to that question, which was not a rhetorical question. Um, the answer in this room is a fair amount of it. Um, I don't think that's whimsical. I don't think that's funny. I don't think that's a joke. I think that is an affront to our Constitution and to the people who wrote it. I think it is incumbent upon those of us who respect, um, and in my case, not just respect, but adore the Constitution, try to figure out why is that? Why is it that we have a federal government, a substantial portion of which is, according to any originalist reading of the Constitution, unconstitutional? My personal belief is that it is uh, largely the responsibility of the judiciary and its decision to essentially get out of the business of enforcing federalism-based limits uh, on the other branches of government since 1942. Um, I think it's that simple. So uh, I agree, by the way, with most of what's been said in terms of the behavior of Congress. I think it is very much like um, a kid taking candy from a candy jar. The problem is you've got a parent that has said there's a rule against that catches it happening all the time, and then rationalizes reasons why it's okay. Oh, well, that's, that's peppermint candy. That's not really candy. That's, that's okay. That's okay. Well, if I aggregate all the M&Ms, that's, that's just a bag of M&Ms, and that's fine. You can do that, too. Um, and that's basically been the behavior of our judiciary since the New Deal, is to constantly challenge itself to rationalize justifications for government action. I'll just share with you one quick example. It happens to be my favorite recent case. This one came down from the 11th Circuit about five months after the Obamacare decision assured us that we now are going to have some limits on Congress's commerce power. Um, and it, basically, I'm going to get it to you really short. Um, the uh, 11th Circuit upheld the exercise of authority by the U.S. Department of Agriculture over the, Heming the Hemingway Home and Museum in Key West, Florida. Why? Because it has a bunch of cats that are descended from one of Hemingway's cats. And guess what? They all sleep outdoors, if you can imagine. And so the U.S. Department of Agriculture got involved, dictated to the museum what the minimum federal cat accommodations were going to be at the museum, went up to the 11th Circuit, and the 11th Circuit said that these cats, which are marooned on an island at the very southern tip of Florida and have never been bought or sold because they were just born there, these cats substantially affect interstate commerce. How? How? 
They sell cat-themed merchandise in the gift shop. And it's all those people coming down from New York and over from my home state of Texas to buy those cat-themed potholders that have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. I submit to you that if there's a maximum velocity at which the framers could be spinning in their graves, they achieved it on that date. <laughs> Judge. <Okay. laughs> I, I'm very thankful that Clark's out there fighting these battles. Um, <laughs> I'm also glad he, he picked up on the parental role analogy because I think it does crystallize the, our differences in perspective on this. Uh, and I, I think mine is what Hamilton would have agreed with as he argued for the proposition that there should be judicial review um, of the constitutionality of congressional acts. He, he made it very clear in, the, in Federalist 78 and 81 to say they're not going to be, the courts should not be viewed as superior to the legislative and executive branches, but co equal. So having the courts be the parent, in our analogy, is a mistake. Um, we've got to remember to go back to the people and the voters as that role. Um, any analogy you stretch it too far, you're going to get into problems. But, but for purposes of this distinction, it, that's the difference in argument. I, I think it's a mistake to rely on the courts to be that parental role because they have problems too, and we have to ultimately rely on the voters to do that. Well, I'm glad to hear uh, David make that uh, clarification. I think the uh, parent-child uh, analogy, whatever limited usefulness it may have, is um, both literally and figuratively juvenile. And uh, that uh, it invites an arrogance among judges um, that is uh, entirely unsuited to the judicial role. Look, I'm as critical as anyone of how legislators can, can, uh, can misbehave. Um, like it or not, um, this is part of the great American experiment in self-government. We have uh, remedies available. Um, you know, maybe we don't uh, exercise them as often as we can. But I would much rather deal, deal with the failings of the democratic processes uh, than, 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 than with the excesses of, of, of judges. Now, uh, unlike Clark, I'm not going to assume that your failure to raise your hand within 0.23 seconds of his asking a very complicated question uh, entitles me to make some sort of grand judgment about uh, where your views are on uh, how much of the federal government is, is constitutional or not. Uh, I think there are many originalists uh, who uh, believe that, uh, you know, that uh, vast amounts of it, even if imprudent, are indeed justified, and even if not, believe that there's no role of the courts, that there are no justiciable lines in which the courts can say that part isn't constitutional, this part is. So, um, you know, our answer is not going to come from uh, the courts. This republic is not going to be saved by the courts. It's far more likely to be ruined by them. And uh, what we need to do is, is, as I think David was suggesting, is uh, do what we can to instill greater responsibility in citizens to, to live up to their duty to uh, have legislators who um, exercise their power responsibly. Can I ask you a question, Claire? Please. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so uh, what, what is the, li how do you respond to that criticism that, that that your point of view is empowering judges who have a track record of not being principled in the exercise of the limitation power. Um, What's the limit? How do you limit them? <clears throat> us. So I got uh, yeah, us. <laughs> Sorry. So I got a, a, a couple of points. Um, first, uh, if we're going to be doing partial quotes from Federal 78, I, I'd like to offer one. <laughs> Hamilton, said, Hamilton said that the courts were designed to be an intermediate body between the people and the legislature in order to keep the latter within the limits assigned to its authority. Where the will of the legislature stands in opposition to that of the people declared in the Constitution, the judges ought to be governed by the latter rather than the former. I, we can do a parent-child analogy. I don't I care. No how argument, I have no argument with that. Uh, understood. Part. Okay. So how do we limit judges? What we want, I think, is for judges to articulate a principled, I call it judicial engagement, a principled mode of analysis that doesn't change from case to case, depending on whether they personally like the constitutional value at stake. So we just had the Supreme Court hand down a unanimous decision this morning um, in Reed, which was a sign case out of Arizona. And they determined that because free speech is an important constitutional value, one they care about, there would be a presumption of unconstitutionality, which the government can rebut uh, by producing evidence that 
the things it says in court, oh, this is really destroying the aesthetics of the town and drivers are driving off the road as they're reading signs. If that's true, prove it. If you don't have the evidence, then your law doesn't get upheld. That's my prescription for all cases. If the government's gonna come into court and assert that there are certain facts, uh, for example, that the um, onion futures market is destroying you know, the availability of onions or increasing price volatility, great, prove it. If you don't have the evidence, then come back when you do. Um, that keeps judges, I think, in the business of doing what they're good at, which is evaluating evidence and the credibility of witnesses and, and pursuing the truth. When we have essentially an irrebuttable presumption of constitutionality, judges are no longer in the truth-seeking business, they're in the rationalizing business, and that's a very bad business for our judiciary to be in. Uh, again, I think Clark is just looking at things backwards or from a wrong entry point into the whole discussion. Let's figure out what the constitutional provisions mean. There, there may indeed be some provisions that are more accommodating of some type of laws than they are of others. That shouldn't be astonishing. But what Clark's whole gambit is, is to come up with this fist on the scale that to, to, to make it so that there's some sort of presumption that every law is unconstitutional. We're going to have judges taking evidence on what uh, the collective intention of the legislature might have been. Um, I, I do not think this is a, the right way to, 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 to uh, even begin to think about the question. Okay, so, so Ed, what's, you said you're not with Thayer, that's too far, that's too much deference. W what's the principle you use to curb legislative excess? When do judges step in? Well, a little bit of, of background. So uh, 19th century Harvard Law professor James Bradley Thayer, as many of you know, has his, uh, his own theory, which um, although it's often overlooked, he applies only to uh, federal judicial review of federal laws, not to judicial review of state laws. And he says that uh, basically uh, a law in order to be struck down has to be manifestly unconstitutional at first glance. Not, you don't even apply the, 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 the traditional judicial tools uh, to determine that. I think there's, I'm not sure there's anyone out there who is a, virtu is, who is a genuine Thayerian, but that doesn't keep um, the epithet from, from being uh, flung at those of us who, who advocate judicial restraint. Judge, in answer to your question, you know, what is the, the quantum of clarity? Um, I've cited some standards here from uh, Federal 78, from Fletcher v. Peck. Uh, John McGinnis has an interesting uh, piece called The Duty of Clarity that I think uh, tries to spell this out. I'm not sure in the abstract you're going to be able to come up with you know, exact words that convey it. Uh, but it's far more than someone's best guess. Uh, it, it, it's far more than, oh, here's some evidence is unconstitutional. It's far more than, well, uh, we're going to start off with, a, with, a, with um, imposing on, on the government uh, a, a, a burden of, sh of, of showing that um, this is constitutional, and if you don't make your, uh, your, your, sh your showing, we're going to strike this down, even if it hasn't been shown to be unconstitutional. Uh, I think there's a lot of, again, I'm not sure it's easy to to define that quantum, but it'd be much closer, I think, to something like clear and to an evidentiary standard of clear and convincing evidence um, than uh, preponderance of the evidence or Clark's, uh, I think, scintilla of evidence. Okay. Okay. Clark, question for you then. Yeah. Um, as as uh, uh, it, it, this this debate reminds me of a debate that we had at the Federalist Society Lawyers Convention a couple of years ago between Hadley Arcus, who was arguing for judges using the natural law and coming up with uh, decisions, and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, Judge Kaczynski, who uh, began by saying, as I recall, I moderated that as well, began by saying, Hadley, I agree with everything you say, but I have one response, and that is, what do you do with Judge Fletcher? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the idea that, that you, you, you're going to be empowering judges in a way that, uh, uh, that, that's too, too far. My question for you is, doesn't your analysis lead to the sort of uh, uh, purposivism in, in, in judicial review that at least for quite a while has been uh, a target of most judicial conservatives saying that purposivism is just something that will allow uh, just far too much uh, play. H how do you respond to that? H how, is, how is your analysis different than a purposivist approach to legislation? I, I appreciate that. It gives me an opportunity to make a point um, that I think is maybe the most important point any of us can make. All I'm arguing for is consistency. 
If the government has to prove its factual assertions in some cases, how about we make them prove their factual assertions in all cases? If the government has to be pursuing a genuinely public-spirited end in some cases, how about we make sure they're pursuing a genuinely public-spirited end in all cases? So actually, it's the proponents of judicial restraint who embrace this bifurcation where we say, well, some of your rights are really important and we're gonna call those fundamental and if the government interferes with those, we're gonna make sure it has a good reason. But most of your rights are unimportant. You know, rights to earn a living or own property or not have your reproductive organs ripped out, those are unimportant rights. And if the government wants to interfere with those, well, just take its word for it. And if it wants to assert that there's a problem like volatility in the onion mark, futures market, or margarine is deadly poison, an actual case, by the way, Powell versus Pennsylvania, we'll just take its word for it. Um, if you like the last 70 years of federal government, if you think that's just been Jake and $18 trillion in debt with $100 trillion in unfunded obligation is a, is a, is a peachy place for the United States to be, then absolutely embrace Ed and Company's um, bifurcated judicial review, where the federal government or any government has to have a serious reason in some cases, but anything it can come up with in other cases. If you'd like to see another 70 years of that, great. Um, if, you, uh, if you think like I can, that this country cannot endure another 70 years of lawless, overweening government, then we need to reconsider what uh, we've been asking of our courts when it comes to judicial review. And I don't think that's purposivism. I think it is intellectual consistency, and we haven't seen that for 75 years. Well, as Clark should know from our previous debates, I reject the, uh, the bifurcated review that he is attributing to me. I think that uh, this whole rational basis versus strict scrutiny is made up out of thin air. I don't think that's the proper way to approach things. But this uh, notion of consistency as though there's, I, again, I, I, we, let's figure out what the provisions of the Constitution mean and then see whether the, the law violates that. I don't understand how Clark thinks that there's some sort of abstract principle of consistency that requires that I guess every single provision uh, be, start off with some, the same approach. I, 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 don't, I don't get that at all. Look, if you don't like the last 70 years of what's happened here, um, the next 70 years with a, uh, Judiciary uh, empowered by um, by Clark's defense of judicial activism to start making up all sorts of positive rights left and right uh, is going to make our current uh, uh, deficit uh, seem like a, a, a little uh, uh, hole in the sand at the beach. Um, this is not uh, the way to solve the problem at all, and we're not going to again this 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 abstract embrace of judicial engagement, whatever the heck that means, um, it's, it's not the right way to begin thinking about what constitutional provisions mean. It's, it's not entirely abstract. I did write a whole book about it. <laughs> <laughs> We've had that discussion too. Okay. Uh, it's, it's now time for the audience to, uh, to get involved. And so we have a, a microphone back here. If you'll please come to the microphone and introduce yourself. Uh, and uh, if there's a, a panelist you uh, would particularly like to hear from first, direct your question to him. Uh, hi, Mike Doherty here with LabMD. I, I really appreciate the um, debate lacking in physical contact. It's very entertaining and I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Same here. It shows how we can civilly get along and disagree. But how is there um, any type of judicial accountability or getting, getting your goals met that's not in such an incredible incredibly slow pace now, especially with what's going on in the regulatory state with the FCC and, and technology moving so fast. By the time the judicial system gets to round to doing its job, things are either dead or fixed. <laughs> um, I, guess, I guess that's for me. I, yeah, uh, so. So, I, so I give an analogy to some, some students at a seminar I helped teach last week, and I, maybe I'll, I'll repeat it here. Um, I personally think that the United States is basically a runaway train coming down a mountain headed towards a bridge that is in a state of disrepair and will absolutely fall apart if we hit that bridge at this speed. I think there are two things that we can do. It depends on what you're good at. You can work to slow down the train, which is what I do at the Institute for Justice. I throw everything I can get my hands on in front of that train to slow it down, or you can get to work on shoring up that bridge. Maybe you can invent, invent cold fusion or interstellar travel or some way to pay back $18 trillion in debt. I don't know what you're good at. Um, but one of the things that has always taken people I think by surprise throughout history, is what the future has in store and how wonderful it can be. We need to give ourselves time 
for something wonderful to come along that will save our bacon from our repudiation of the principles of limited government. That will come, there will be a terrible price to pay for that um, if we continue in the direction we have been. But we can slow down the train and we can start shoring up that bridge. I don't know what you're good at, but get to work on one of the two. I share Clark's optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I, I do too, and in fact, I had an interesting meeting with a, a donor who's also a Federalist Society member, and he said he's looking for candidates who are more pessimistic than we are. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I had to say I can't do that because I've got to get up each day and fight the fight. <laughs> the, the I, I guess using Clark's analogy now, um, don't view the judicial solution as the only part of that slowing the train. Um, so, it, and I think, as I understand, well, I know from the board discussions, the Federal Society is going to embark on a discussion, is there a constitutional theory of the first branch that needs to be thought through and talked about? Um, that will, I think, allow us to hold up the mirror to, to, to these members and say, are, you're, you are or are not behaving properly. Um, and then groups that are engaged in the political realm, like the one I'm with now, Club for Growth, can take that out in the political debate. Um, but it, so when we're thinking about questions of law, um, we're organized to be a, a legal society, so we naturally turn to what's the role of the courts. And, and I guess I'm just repeating my admonition, be careful of what you ask for and if there's a problem in the legislative or executive branches, think about solutions that get them back on track uh, and don't put too much stress on, on the. Okay. Okay. Next question. Right, thank you. Uh, I'm Joel Mandelman. I filed an amicus brief uh, on behalf of Senator Johnson's challenge to Ob one part of Obamacare. But I wanted to ask, I've got two observations and I'm interested in hearing the panel's response, particularly into what the clerk said before. If the courts hadn't done what they've done over the last 70 years. You would have had a constitutional amendment by 1937 or 38 that turned Article I, Section 8 inside out and said Congress can do anything that's not explicitly prohibited. And secondly, you would have had, as part of that amendment, a redefinition of interstate commerce, which would be even worse, that has given Congress even greater power than it has assumed in all the horrible examples you've uh, been positing. And the second part is nobody on the panel has mentioned the danger, the constitutional danger, to federal judges inventing constitutional rights that are found nowhere in the Constitution, whether it's the exclusionary rule or the fruit of the poison tree doctrine or abortion or the right of somebody to travel from one state to another to get a bigger welfare check and not allowing the recipient state to say you've got to be here for one year, you know, Goldberg versus Kelly, and so many other atrocities that have been committed not by irresponsible legislators, but by power-hungry judges who seem to think they've got the right to do whatever they want in inventing new rights. So I'd be interested in everybody's Thank you, comment on that. Uh, I'm not gonna try and tackle all of that. I'll, I guess I'll do the last two really quickly. Um, so I, as I understand the proposition is that uh, if the court had uh, not thrown in the towel on enforcing federalism-based limits in the 1930s, we'd have an even worse definition of interstate commerce today. So as I understand it, right now, according to the Supreme Court, I have like three rights, um, federalism-based rights. I can carry a gun within 1,000 feet of a school. I cannot be hailed into federal court to answer for torts of gender-motivated violence, and I cannot purchase government-approved health insurance if I'm willing to pay a higher tax. Those are the three things the Supreme Court has said I have a right to do. I can't imagine a much worse definition of interstate commerce than we have now when it comes to limiting or not limiting government power. The federal government even has the ability to make it a crime to grow a plant in your backyard. That's pretty bad. Um, I don't think it could get a lot worse than that. As to the last point about, I'm just going to summarize it as saying judicial tyranny. Um, as we sit here today, each and every one of us is subject to so many federal laws that no one has been able to count them all, and they have tried. 
It's at least 4,000 stat criminal statutes and at least a couple hundred thousand regulatory crimes. As I sit here today, and as I suspect most of you sit here today, the total number of judicial orders I am subject to equals zero. I have never been subject to any judge's order. The only thing the judiciary prevents us from doing is going out and imposing our will other pe on other people in certain ways. Very few people are subject to the direct control of any judge and ever have been. I'm comfortable with that. Uh, very briefly, obviously the courts through the uh, exercises in judicial activism, the uh, wonderful examples that the questioner came up with have really shrunk the realm of representative government in a way that has uh, corrupted our culture in lots of respects, it's really deprived us of the ability to uh, d define what rights um, ought to be protected, and which ought, ought to be. Perhaps Clark doesn't care about that. Um, the framers sure did, and I sure do. And uh, just to be clear, um, again, uh, to the question, I certainly meant um, by, by reference to uh, criticize um, many or all the things that, that, that you were talking about. I, I believe we've very much had a, uh, you know, an era of judicial activism that's been very costly, and we're still, still living in it. Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm uh, Jack Bierman from Boston University. I just have one quick observation and one question. The observation is, is that the view from the left is that the courts have been too restrictive on federal power, and I wonder how you would react to that. The, um, the question, though, is what do you think about doctrines like the uh, Dormant Commerce Clause uh, jurisprudence? If that, I know that's about state laws and local laws, but it seems to be you know, very similar to the kind of themes you're talking about, about the state's power to regulate things and how the court has actually taken that away. Is that for me also? Yeah, I think okay. that's mostly for you. Um, I don't know how to respond to the proposition from any direction that the Supreme Court has been too restrictive of the federal government. I, I, I guess I sort of visualize um, uh, having you know, James Madison and, and uh, Alexander Hamilton sitting in the back of the room you know, laughing themselves silly to hear that. I certainly can't imagine anybody saying that with a straight face outside of academia. I just, it's, not, it's totally inconsistent with my perception of what, of what the, the normal people think. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, and as far as I, the Dormant Commerce Clause, I'm very aware that Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas um, um, reject the idea that there is such a thing as a Dormant Commerce Clause that imposes restrictions on state regulation because it, it interferes with interstate commerce. Uh, I think it's too deep a subject to try to get into in, in, in the short time, you know, that one has to answer a question like that. Um, I will say that, that, that we have used it in, in attempting to vindicate economic liberty and the courts have been all over the map. Some circuits apply a somewhat robust uh, approach to enforcing the Dormant Commerce Clause and some courts have just turned it into rational basis review and so functionally it's pretty close to useless right now. Just a quick observation, if I may, on Professor Bierman's first point. I, I think he's certainly right that there are lots of folks on the left who view the court as, as too restrictive. I might share Clark's amazement at that, but um, more importantly, I think, uh, the, the folks who uh, are in academia are uh, training or you know, brainwashing the next generation of, of, of lawyers as they have the last couple of generations. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the uh, empowerment of judges that Clark is urging um, obviously depending in part on what happens in the next presidential election, but could very well uh, lead to uh, these uh, previously obscure academics um, uh, d d um, d deciding a whole range of issues for us in a way that Clark uh, and all libertarians uh, would not like. Uh, let me just say a couple things. One, it's great, Jack, that you're here. Um, we're, we were classmates at University of Chicago and engaged in debates way back then. Um, I, I've gone back and forth on the Dormant Common Clause, Commerce Clause, uh, but your question made me think of a different point, which I concluded would take us too far afield, but it's, an in, I think, an interesting one that Dean and, and the organizers can put into a later uh, panel, and that is if you had this same presumption applied to state legislation, uh, would what would have been the track record of the Supreme Court to date on d declaring laws unconstitutional at the state level? And it, because if you look at it, the, the vast majority of constitutional law, which results from declaring an act unconstitutional, have been vis-a-vis -vis state actions. Um, so perhaps extending this, this presumption may have further limited their activity in that area. I don't know. Um, but it, but it, was a, it made, brought to mind a very interesting question that, that I think the Federalist Society could profitably 
discuss at a, another program. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi there. I'm Larry Stratton from the Stover Center at Waynesburg University. I have a question for Ed. You said that, um, in contrast to Clark, that you would look at each provision of the Constitution and see what it means and uh, not have this presumption one way or another. Um, could you take us through the three cases he mentioned of Blaisdell, Wickard, and Kelo? Blaisdell, Wickard, and Kelo, did you say? Well, the short answer is uh, no, I don't think I'm prepared to take us through these three cases here, but I think you, 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 you um, I, I may have misstated or you may have misunderstood um, my position. Um, I do believe that what's ca called a presumption of, of constitutionality, which is a very modest thing, ought to exist. I wasn't repudiating that. As, as simply saying that I don't think that, uh, that Clark's claim of consistency, I don't, I don't know what that means. Um, I think we ought to first look and figure out what does a constitutional provision mean, and then see whether the law is consistent with it. So in Blaisdell, uh, that seems to be a great example of the court gutting um, a, a constitutional provision. Um, the, contract, the contract clause uh, in that case, I'm not prepared to, d to discuss it in any detail. Um, you know, Kilo, um, it's, it's funny that, uh, well, not funny, but you know, the public purpose, public use rather, uh, provision of the Fifth Amendment had been gutted before by Justice O'Connor, who suddenly found herself in dissent. <laughs> In, in, in Kilo, so I have you know real problems um, with what the court uh, did there. And look, Wickard is obviously a very, very expansive, extreme, extreme uh, view of, of the Commerce Clause that I'm not uh, not ready to to embrace without further analysis. But um, I I do I don't think there's anything about a presumption of constitutionality that dictates uh, contrary results in those cases. Contrary to what I'm saying here, I mean. Um, so just really quickly, for uh, there is it is very easy to understand what I, what consistency means in constitutional litigation. I'll give you one clear illustration. If you are challenging an advertising ban in court, the government must support that ban with something other than speculation or conjecture. It has to have evidence. So if the government says that that camel, you know, advertising on those cigarettes is making kids smoke cigarettes, they have to prove it. But if the government bans the product itself, that's only rational basis review because it's not speech, it's just selling a product which the Supreme Court thinks is less important than advertising a product. So if it's just a ban on selling the product, the government is permitted to support its, its restrictions using what the Supreme Court calls rational speculation or what we litigators would call make-believe facts. That's an example of the inconsistency of constitutional doctrine. Well, I don't understand that example. I also don't know why, um, instead of uh, invoking uh, current made-up doctrine, Clark doesn't uh, look to uh, try to discern what the original meaning of, of the First Amendment is in order to determine whether or not an advertising ban uh, is constitutional. Yes, sir. Bill Bonner, I'm an attorney from Media, Pennsylvania. Um, our conversation seems to be limited to Article Three judges. My particular concern is with Article Two administrative law judges, and my um, particular interest is in the growth during the next 70 years of the role of administrative law judges to overshadow Article Three judges and to prevent the people from having access to Article Three judges. Um, if the FCC loses, it can just go in-house and have its own judges decide. It doesn't need an Article Three judge. And, it, and the people lose um, a plethora of discovery rights, substantive rights, and procedures. And so I, I think that the greatest risk to the public is in the growth of Article II judges. Um, does anyone have any um, support for that proposition? I, I, I think you've stated it very articulately, and I can't think of much to add, except uh, there was an article that came out. I, I wish I could remember where it came out. I read it within the last few weeks. It was Biv and Expose, and the question in the article was, uh, do administrative law judges feel pressure to rule in favor of the agencies that they work for in these theoretically contested 
uh, administrative law proceedings, and the answer, at least among the yes. judges who were interviewed, was absolutely yes. Yeah. I think that is completely unacceptable. Um, and, 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 and I agree with you completely. That is an absolute violation of due process, both textually and as a matter of principle. And these aren't really judges in any meaningful sense, and perhaps we should stop calling them judges. Um, but uh, look, that's a huge issue, way beyond the scope of this panel. I'll just say, uh, you know, Phil Hamburger has written a, uh, a, a book uh, blasting this whole phenomenon. Uh, I, I think it's uh, just, it, it does present the severe threat you describe, and we ought to figure out how to cope with it. Um, let me just add two thoughts that are worth discussing at another time in, full, in greater detail that are possible remedies for that. One would be a requirement that the Bill of Rights and the procedural protections you have in an Article III court have to be part of the process in, in these ALJ proceedings. Uh, it would be a radical transformation of, of the way they do business. The, the second would be uh, to consider applying the separation of powers principles to the whole regulatory state. Um, and there's, I've been working with a young lawyer who did the bulk of the work on the article on, on the proposition for how to do that. Um, those, are, those are remedies given the fact that we've strayed from the constitutional system um, and therefore probably are not ideal, but, uh, but perhaps more politically possible um, to deal with the problem. So when, when, uh, when I was asked to uh uh, chair of this uh, a panel, Dean said the only absolute rule is you have to finish by 12.20, and, and we've, we've gone over that. Uh, would, would you join with me in thanking our panelists for the <laughs>